This is CBC Here and Now. Hurricane Larry took the best of uh, the shingles by the looks of her. You know, it's too bad that I woke up to see this, but again, no one was hurt. We heard a huge bang. It had fallen to the side of our house. Luckily, like right between all the houses. It was just a big roar. And of course, you heard the, uh, the bricks hitting the cars. And, uh, and that was it. Yep, that was Hurricane Larry swept in, mangled eastern Newfoundland, doing significant damage. And today, the cleanup continues. Chance of flurries moving in across Labrador tonight, especially in the higher elevations. A few showers across the island, but temperatures dropping is the big story. We'll break it down with your full other forecast coming up. Still ahead, I'll tell you about a woman with intellectual disabilities who was living in a personal care home in Stephenville. Her family says that she was being locked in her apartment alone for hours at a time. You could see like Allison was visibly scared. That story is still ahead on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Hurricane Larry has moved on, but the cleanup continues. Many are still sorting through debris, shredded fences and trees that snap like matchsticks left behind in Larry's wake. Drop-off locations are up and running in St. John's for damaged trees and other debris. The city says large branches, even whole trees, can be dropped off to the large gravel parking lots at Kitty Bitty Lake and Bowering Park. Those locations will remain open until the storm cleanup is continued. Smaller branches, leaves and twigs can be disposed of on recycling day. The city says it will accept an unlimited number of paper yard waste bags. A local arborist says his crews have been overwhelmed with calls. We are certainly trying to accommodate all requests. Um, we are in a bit of a, uh, um, you know, a stage where you know, we're categorizing the, um, uh, the priorities. I'm um, starting with um, accessibility and um, um, tree and branch failures that are affecting structures on homes, on roofs, on vehicles. And several slowdowns to tell you about as crews continue to assess and repair the damage brought on by Larry. As you see, some coastal roads on the southern Avalon remain partially or fully closed this evening, like Route 90 on Salmonier Line, where the bridge in St. Vincent's has been washed out. Yes, government says Saturday's continuing storm surge slowed crews down. They couldn't get out to survey the damage right away. There's no set timeline for reopening. Well, class is expected to resume tomorrow at Mary Queen of Peace Elementary in St. John's. That school remained closed today after the storm peeled off part of the roof and hurled it into the parking lot. And at the height of the storm, 60,000 people were without power this weekend. Perhaps not surprising considering all the downed trees and poles. Newfoundland Power tells CBC that by now everyone's electricity should be restored. Larry took down the Iceberg Alley tent in St. John's, and that was one of the major casualties from the weekend, destroyed beyond repair, in addition to roofs, roads, and trees. I'm 63 years here. I've never seen nothing like it. The hardest wind ever I heard. Igor never had no wind like this, nothing like this. I was looking out the window and uh, watching uh, the wind blow in the rain, and... Then all of a sudden, I got a, a vibration. A shock came back to the building, and I jumped up two or three times. And my cat was with me, and she turned around, and ran downstairs with, you know, from the shock I guess when the bricks came off the building. 1:30 this morning. That's when the brick here came down. I was talking to the tenant up top, and that's when she said it happened. And it was a, just a big roar. And of course, she heard the. Uh, the bricks hitting the cars, and, uh, and that was it. It was quite tense. About 2.33, I see this dying down. I think I was ready to go down the car anyway, any time. This bang. You can see up there, the bedroom window is a mark there where it struck. So it's very lucky, okay, that if the window had broken, that would have been gone. But I was most concerned about Teresa. Well, uh, Hurricane Larry took the best of uh, the shingles by the looks of her. Um, I was actually not in the house, which is good, and I'm glad I wasn't. Um, I got a call from my sister-in-law, and she was like, there's a roof off somewhere in Fort Waldegrave. <laughs> so uh, I came out and found out it was mine. 
I rent this, so I don't own this place. So I guess I uh, just have to look into insurances and hopefully get that fixed. Um, I don't know if it's safe to go in there right now at the moment just because it's on the power line. So, you know, it's too bad that I woke up to see this, but again, no one was hurt. So. The tent was, uh, you know, could take up to 125 kilometer wind. But at 1.52 a.m., we got a gust of, of uh, 144 kilometers uh, per hour wind, and the tent failed. It just was not engineered to take that uh, speed. And, uh, but, you know, if, if it had stayed by 120, 125, we would probably be still having shows in the tent, but mother nature had other plans. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the city of St. John's and St. John's sports and entertainment were so proactive on this. So I really got to give, uh, thanks to them. We're going to do the best we can in mile one and, and you can drink on the floors and, and, and in the stands and have a great time and, uh, enjoy some music. A lot of work to do. Now, in other news, more than 90,000 salmon have died at an aquaculture site on the south coast after the facility lost power from the hurricane. 92,000 92, salmon at a site known as the Gorge died. It's run by Maui, which has 900,000 fish at the site. The Department of Fisheries, Forestry and Agriculture says in a news release that due to the power outage during the storm, the site experienced sudden low dissolved oxygen levels. The fish are approximately three kilograms in size and harvesting was scheduled to begin before the end of the year. Aquaculture companies are now required to notify the public when more than 10% of the fish die at one time. And that policy came into effect after this salmon die off two years ago on the south coast. The company eventually apologized for delays in accurately reporting the scope of that die off. There were problems reporting publicly this time. The government news release says due to power outages resulting from the hurricane, the company is experiencing difficulty posting their public report to the Newfoundland Aquaculture Industry Association website. The department says the company has already begun removing the dead fish, roughly a quarter of a million kilograms, and it says deeper nets and aeration equipment is to be used to reduce the problem in the future. Nine new cases of COVID-19 to tell you about from the weekend, but the number of active cases is actually going down. So what do we know about who's getting COVID? Let's bring in here announced Peter Cowan. So Peter, what can you tell us about these cases? Well, Carolyn, first some important context with those numbers. These nine new cases are from three days. So that's only an average of three new cases a day. But let's break down those numbers. First, to the eastern region, which has almost all the cases, there are eight cases there. Half are related to travel, three within Canada, one internationally. The other four are contacts of a previous case. In western, there is one new case. It's a contact of a previous case. What's interesting here is the age of the people who are getting COVID. Seven of the nine cases, or 78%, from the weekend are people 20 to 39 years old. Now, we don't know the vaccination status of these new cases, but we know that that age group has one of the lowest vaccination rates. This time is the, also the time of year where we see more young people traveling as in-person classes resume at colleges and universities. Now, there is one person in hospital and with 14 recoveries, there are now 40 active cases. For an interesting comparison, the other Atlantic provinces announced a lot more cases today. Since Friday, New Brunswick has reported 122 cases, Nova Scotia 73, and PEI has announced 16. Anthony? Thank you, Peter. That's Peter Cowan reporting live from our newsroom. A group in the province held a protest today against vaccine mandates. It took place outside the Health Sciences Building in St. John's, just across from the CBC here on the sidewalk along Prince Philip Drive. Now, it's part of a series of protests that are happening right across the country. Here now is Meg Roberts has more. About 50 people gathered in St. John's to protest mandatory vaccines, as well as the provincial government's newly announced vaccine passport program. According to the organizer of the rally, they are not against vaccinations. Dana Medcalf is also the People's Party of Canada candidate for St. John's East. PPC t-shirts were being passed around at the protest. Medcalf says what the government is proposing is discriminatory. 
Well, we want Newfoundland to repel the mandates. It's a very, very slippery slope that we're on in regards to uh, medical autonomy, human rights. So I think Newfoundland should take a pause. We only have had lost seven people in, in almost two years. We normally lose 30 to influenza. There is no sense of panic. This is going to decimate small business. It will collapse our health care system. Travis Day says he's a registered nurse working in the province. He says in school he was taught to advocate for patients, the right to choose and self-autonomy, and he feels that applies to the COVID-19 vaccine. But I, I don't think that it's necessary. I don't think that the, the risk of what is going to come out of all of this to say even the 10 to 14 percent of Newfoundlanders right now who are not vaccinated, um, what they have to endure to moving forward with in terms of public access, I don't think that that's necessary for what benefit it is going to provide. The protest was held by a group called Canadian Frontline Nurses. However, the registered nurses union in Newfoundland and Labrador is calling the protest unfortunate. In a statement, it said it's unfortunate that this group is taking attention away from the important vaccination efforts happening across the province and country. The public should rest assured that the vast majority of Newfoundland and Labrador's registered nurses and nurse practitioners are united in their commitment to operate from a stringent code of ethics and they are duty bound to use science, evidence and facts in providing the care they deliver to their patients. There are concerns about misinformation coming from the anti-mandatory vaccine camp. We reached out to the provincial government to address those concerns. No one would talk. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, an abrupt change in a return to work policy is taking core provincial government employees by surprise. That's according to a union that represents thousands of people working from home. NAEP says provincial government workers were sent notice in July that there would be a gradual transition back to work and accommodations would be made for those working at home to reduce the spread of COVID-19. But now the union says the province has quietly done an about face and managers are telling workers to return to their offices within days. Jerry Earle says it's creating problems like finding childcare for thousands. There's been no significant reason told to them other than they're expected to return to workplace. You got to understand many of these workers were on the impression just about eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago that they were going to be able to work from home had made specific arrangements. Uh, some have started to even do some structural changes part of their homes and that, uh, getting security features in place. Now to learn without little notice that that's uh, an actually reverse decision uh, of government. Well, late this afternoon, the provincial government sent CBC a statement responding to the concerns raised by NAEP. It writes, we continue to focus on the efficient delivery of services to residents and access to a safe workplace for our employees as we continue to work on opportunities for e-work within the public service. Employees have been asked to return to their physical workspace. Now, the statement also says that e-work arrangements that are in place as part of an accommodation will continue if required. Well, a 38-year-old man in Happy Valley Goose Bay has been charged with a number of sexual offenses involving youth. Police say the man used the social media app Snapchat to lure younger people. He's facing several charges, including sexual interference, invitation to touching, luring, forcible confinement and extortion. Police say the man targeted two young people, but it's believed there could be more victims and the RCMP is asking anyone with information to contact them or crime. Stoppers. Well, now to the West Coast, where a family member of a 46 year old woman with intellectual disabilities says she was neglected and not properly cared for at her home in Stephenville. Minette Firth wants to know why her sister was locked in her apartment for hours at a time and also why her food was restricted. Now, Western Health is involved. CBC's Colleen Connors reports. Minette Firth talks to her sister via FaceTime every day from New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. She's 46 and has intellectual disabilities that requires 24-hour care. Oh, she is the kindest, biggest hearted person you, you would ever meet. But Firth was shocked when she pulled up here on July 18th to her sister's care home. So when we walked up to the door, we could see Allison through her window and she was just walking circles. Like there was no TV, no books, no nothing, just walking circles. Firth says when she went to open her sister's basement apartment door, it was locked. Decker told her she had been locked in for hours. And you could see like Allison was visibly 
scared. Allison kept um, apologizing over and over and over. She asked if she was going to be allowed to eat supper with them that day. And she was just, you could just tell she was really scared. Decker, days after she was born, suffered multiple seizures that caused significant brain damage. She moved from care home to care home, but most recently was in this house with the Bay St. George Residential Support Board, a company that cares for adults like Decker, funded by the provincial government. Firth thought she was receiving 24-hour care, but says her sister, who has a mental capacity of a three-year-old, was mistreated. She wasn't allowed food after 5.30 p.m., and her fridge was locked. How does it make you feel when you hear about she being, you know, trapped in this, this apartment on her own? I feel like a failure as a sister. Like, I feel like we failed her. We didn't know, like, if, if, uh, sorry. If we hadn't gotten there at that exact time, we still probably wouldn't know because they didn't know exactly when I was getting there. So they, 10 minutes later, they could have had her door unlocked and we wouldn't have known a thing. After that family visit, Firth moved her sister into a new home with a different company called Momentum. The change in Allison's face, even when we FaceTime now, is absolutely crazy. Like she's she's just a lot happier. She's sleeping a lot better. They're trying to undo some of the damage. She believes the staff and managers with the support board should face consequences for their mistreatment, even face criminal charges of abuse and neglect. I reached out to the executive director of the Bay St. George Residential Support Board. They have an unmarked office just off the main street here in Stephenville. But Michelle King didn't want to comment. She suggested that we reach out to Western Health instead. Western Health did confirm the health board is investigating this case, saying in a statement to CBC that Western Health is reviewing this situation. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Stephenville. To Labrador now, the family of Burton Winters believes the lost teenager was treated differently because of where he lived. His family is calling for more search and rescue resources in the north because it took three days of searching to find the 14-year-old's body. This was shared today at the ongoing inquiry into search and rescue policies, and the CBC's Heidi Adder was there. Burton Winters' family says their son was treated differently because he lived in northern Labrador. His stepmother says after the teen went missing, the family faced a slew of setbacks, broken search and rescue helicopters, bad weather, and the military's decision not to send a helicopter because it would mean another region going without. Burton Winters walked 19 kilometers on the ice before freezing to death back in 2012. He appeared to be trying to reach a small island with an unmanned lighthouse, but there was open water in his path. Natalie Jacques says the inquiry is difficult for the family, but tough questions need to be asked. I believe he had walked as far as he could, and we are all here today walking the rest for him. The family wants to see more search and rescue helicopters stationed in the north for future searches. They also want emergency equipment to be fixed faster and for all possible resources to be sent when there's a missing child. The inquiry into ground search and rescue will continue throughout this month with a final report expected at the end of November. Heidi Adder, CBC News, Makovic. Larry leveled countless fences like this one across eastern Newfoundland. And then, of course, there's the trees. So if your yard is littered with trees all over the place, you got to get rid of them. There's a safe way to do it. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, we're in a backyard that is a, like a lot of backyards post Larry. And joining me now is Ryan Painter. He's an arborist and we're gonna get some advice. Before you give us some tips, um, what's your sense of the aftermath of Larry? Well, I think what, uh, what we're seeing from an arborist perspective is certainly a bit predictable. So there are characteristics of certain species that we see. There's um, predictable failures of, um, uh, you know, of trees that have uh, what we call weak branch attachments or that have structural defects. So we've seen a lot of those throughout the, the last couple of days. Um, and uh, overall, we're finding that the, that the damage is, is moderate. Really? It's not it's not extreme. It's it's not quite heavy, um, and I think it's a lot to do with um, you know how tough our trees are to begin with here in the Avalon Peninsula. Um, you know they put up with all kinds of wicked weather, and um, and they hold tough. So it's not uncommon for us to get high winds. And trees are um, an adaptable organism. So the um, you know the fiercer the winds they get, or the more motion they create, well they adapt. So they will um, uh, you know produce roots on uh, you know windward and leeward sides that will um, help fortify them in these types of conditions. So, um, you know, it's, um, it's certainly been an inconvenience and a nuisance and there's been some minor damage, but we've been pulling what we would call here in St. John's large trees off of homes, um, you know, with sort of negligible damage that, um, you know, that's, you know, not that significant. So are you busy? Are you booked? We are overwhelmed busy. Uh, we are uh, two crews with uh, two sets of equipment um, and uh, we are completely flat out. So um, we're servicing um, um, everything from, uh, um, you know, people that are having a hard time accessing their, their homes or their driveways um, to doing um, pruning, maintenance and, um, you know, corrections to significant um, branch and limb failures at, um, at Government House. So um, we are certainly trying to accommodate all requests. Um, we are in a bit of a, uh, um, you know, a stage where, you know, we're categorizing the, um, uh, the priorities. I'm um, starting with um, accessibility and um, um, tree and branch failures that are affecting structures on homes, on roofs, on vehicles. And, um, and then we'll be working into, uh, you know, corrective pruning and assessment later at that. All right, there's a whole that. scientific lingo to this that I was completely unaware of. So in a place like this where essentially it's just inconvenient, it's a mess, some people might be tempted to do it themselves, get out the chainsaw and off they go. Sure. Give us your best professional tips. Well, approach the tree from a distance, certainly. So getting a broader uh, look at the tree, stepping back and looking at the, at the crown of the tree to, um, to identify where there might have been an, any branch failures or anything that looks not quite normal. So uh, a limb that's failed or a branch that's hanging, it might have a little bit of a different color in the tree where the leaves might be upside down or at a different angle. So that's an indicator that there's been, um, that there's been a break or a failure in the tree. Um, and then approach slowly and have a look and see if there's any large dead hanging limbs. Um, that's certainly um, you know, the first steps. Have a look around the trunk of the tree, see if there's a lean on it or if there's any heaving where the ground may have, um, may have come up, and which would indicate um, a root failure, um, which you wanna be careful of. That tree may be, may be um, at risk of, uh, of toppling over. I know you're very busy. I guess the other thing is that if there's any issue of electrical cables or wiring down that you get the professionals to get rid of that first. Right? Cer certainly, if a tree is touching um, an, ener an energized um, uh, service line to your, to your home or a distribution line, those are the, 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 the wires that go from pole to pole on the street, first call should definitely be to Newfoundland Power. Even the low voltage communication lines, really that should be handled by, um, by Newfoundland Power that can come and assess it and make the proper, uh, the proper cuts to relieve the, the tension or compression, whatever it may be on the line, um, but also not to do any damage to, you know, to what may be below it. All right, Ryan, I know you're busy. I wanna thank you for your time. You're great, thanks very much. Time for a check of your weather forecast. Ryan Snodden here with you in for Ashley tonight and always a pleasure, of course, to be on the program. And first we have to talk about what I know was a very sleepless night for many of you. I heard from friends and of course, uh, many of you uh, on social media that, uh, yeah, not a lot of sleep on Friday night and for good reason with these winds. Uh, just a quick recap in case you've missed some of those big totals. Cape St. Mary's at 182. 145 at St. John's Airport, uh, 129 up at Cape Bonavista, Green Island at 142, and just some very impressive gusts from, of course, Larry that made landfall just west of Long Harbor around 1.30 early, early Saturday morning. And I hope that, uh, yes, the cleanup is uh, going okay and that uh, your nerves have uh, somewhat calmed down after what I know was a pretty rough Friday night, especially for a few hours there. Now, 
from a hurricane to special weather statements for snow across Labrador. It is September, isn't it? Uh, you, you know, uh, from Nain all the way down uh, the coast uh, into the Makovic Postville region, as well as Happy Valley Goose Bay and that Eagle River section. This is where we could see as much as five centimeters of accumulation, especially in the higher terrain areas uh, for tonight. And that is all thanks to some cooler air wrapping in on the backside of this weather system, which is bringing some cloud cover across southeastern Newfoundland for this evening into the overnight. Maybe a couple of isolated showers. But yes, that will clear out. We've got some uh, clearing skies, but also with this cooler air, just the potential for not only those flurries, but a few showers in the mix. An area of high pressure moving in uh, will bring a little more in the way of sunshine. And you can see uh, that we will see that clear out through this evening. There are those chances of showers that will linger kind of on the, along the west coast, northern peninsula more so, and up into Labrador tonight with that chance of showers. And you can see those flurries indeed mixing in for places like Happy Valley, the Goose Bay, especially the Mealy Mountain area, and of course the higher terrain up uh, the west, uh, up the north coast rather of Labrador. And uh, yes, so for overnight lows tonight, we're talking about low single digits, near freezing for Labrador City, and yes, some flakes in the mix there as well. Obviously, with those temperatures, chance of showers best from Corner Brook up the northern peninsula, and that isolated risk of a sprinkle through this evening into the early overnight as that little system sails to the southeast of the island. Temperatures kind of around that 9 to 12 range. Now, as we look through tomorrow, we will see that chance of showers continuing along the west coast, the northern peninsula. That wet snow kind of wrapping up in Labrador throughout the morning into the early afternoon, though, possibly lingering uh, up over the higher terrain of southeastern parts of Labrador. Chance of a shower, though, isolated through central Newfoundland tomorrow. And with those northwest winds, a big difference in temperatures tomorrow across the island. I mean, you can see it here with the forecast. We'll see temperatures in the high teens near 20 across the Avalon Peninsula. Winds shifting to northwest, so watch for those temps to start to drop a little bit for places like Clarenville uh, down towards the Buren Peninsula. And you can see where temperatures are basically going to be cut in half as we work our way towards the northern peninsula uh, from Grossmore and up through St. Anthony temperatures near 10 degrees northwest winds here driving in from 50 so uh, gusting to 50 rather so it will be feeling uh, rather cool and across Labrador you can see where we're going to be basically hanging out in those mid single digits along the coast throughout the day any of that snow should be wrapping up as we said throughout the morning uh, with some isolated lingering showers even into the afternoon a few flakes in the morning for Lab West and we will see some sunshine developing as we work into the afternoon. As that little area of high pressure moves in, it will bring some sunshine, but we have another system moving in uh, behind that that's going to bring some showers. Labrador Wednesday, the island on Thursday. We'll break it down with your five-day forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Stokesy, back to you. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much, Ryan. Great to see you. Oh, Stokesy, I haven't heard that in a while. Well, the people of North Harbor in St. Mary's Bay are coping with the damage caused by Hurricane Larry. The storm left large amounts of debris, deteriorated roads, and took down power lines. Now, while no one was injured, longtime residents there say this was the worst so storm they've experienced. Saturday morning, um, yeah, definitely um, all along the coastline here, and especially down here where we are here, this was all... Uh, there was a lot of debris, a, a lot of debris all over the road. All the road, half the road was all shot. But actually, you couldn't even come through with a truck. So you couldn't because um, all the ocean had washed up rocks and stones. It's, it's going to be like our houses are our houses, like, you know. So what, what do you prepare for this? Um, as you can see, like, you know, we're right, right in the wing of the ocean. If she's coming, she's coming. Yesterday was good with, um, with the services, like, you know, Newfoundland Power and that, like, you know, they kept us updated and that what was, what was coming down. And, the road, the transportation road, um, they were down with their plough and they cleared it. They cleared it. They opened the road pretty quick for what it was, but to me, if, if it was a longer hurricane, we wouldn't have had a road. So hopefully, if they are coming, they're coming short, probably three hours, that's all we want to see. Otherwise than that, um, it could have been a whole lot different if it was, uh, if it was longer. Like. The force come with that water, to put that water over the road and up in people's yard like that is unbelievable. And we have the power gone now since one o'clock the other night. We still don't have any power. I'm 63 years here. I've never seen anything like it in, in my life. No, sir. <clears throat> the hardest wind ever I heard. Really bad. So you can see the damage in the community here, you, you know. Hopefully now that, uh, you know, our road will get done before the winter 
I mean, it desperately needs to be done. Most of our pavement is washed out now towards the, we say, like the sea area, and it's very dangerous. But if they don't do the roads properly this time and do them right, we can see, as we see today, that there'll be destruction again if it's not done right. And I mean, like I said, you know, that uh, it, it definitely have to be done. There's no good of, of just talking about it. We got to have it done. We did not know that, no. that this was all afoot behind the scenes. We didn't know that if you just mentioned something, something so phenomenal could happen. Talk about a high note. An Ontario couple elopes in St. John's and is treated to a surprise wedding performance from one of their favorite musicians. They'll tell us the story coming up.
Welcome back to Hearing Now. Well, it was a low-key wedding that ended on a high note, thanks to one well-known musician in St. John's. A couple from Burlington, Ontario, eloped in the capital city over the weekend. They chose St. John's because they're big fans of Alan Doyle and planned to go to his concert at Iceberg Alley. Instead, they received a surprise wedding gift. I caught up with the couple at St. John's Airport just before they were about to return home. So before COVID hit, we were planning on eloping in New York City in 2020, and those plans got delayed. And we rescheduled for 2021 and realized that it wasn't going to happen either. So about six weeks ago, we said, where else could we go? And one spot that neither of us had ever been to before, but that was high on our list to visit was St. John's. Yeah. So we decided that we would come here. We've never been here, but we love the music from out here and we love the art. We've got a big piece of uh, Newfoundland art on our wall and it's, we just always knew we'd get here at some point. We didn't know it was going to be for a wedding. Yes. And we went searching first for accommodation and we landed on the Windsor House B&B. &B. And we phoned that morning and Lisa answered and it just fell into place. Yeah. So they wanted to keep it very low key, just very simple. They didn't want any hoopla, mm -hmm. so I said well, I would help them look after the officiant and the flowers and the makeup and the hair. She was ecstatic. It, the day that we were proposing that we wanted to get married, which was September 10th, happened to be her and Jerry's yeah. anniversary as well. And we said done. And we happened to mention yeah. that we love Alan Doyle. And when we talked about, well, we really big Alan Doyle fans, we're going to go to the concert Saturday night. Yeah. The Iceberg, Alley the Iceberg yes. Alley concert. And I said, well, he actually lives around the corner from me. Maybe I'll see what I can do. So I sat down and I wrote him a little letter and basically asked him if he would help me and it would make their day very special. And that's what he did. Oh, it happened very quickly. I got a, a note from uh, from Jerry and the gang here at the at the uh, at the B&B &B at, at the inn and uh, they uh, told me that there was a couple here who had come for the Iceberg Alley Tent Festival and were decided to elope and wouldn't it be nice if they got to see you in person so I live in the neighborhood so I just made my way over and sang a song it was just a nice thing to be a part of their special day. We did not know that, no. she, that this was all afoot behind the scenes we didn't know that if you just mentioned something something so phenomenal could happen. Yeah. So just before 11 we're standing out, it's all very informal, yeah. figuring out how we're going to do this, and down the street, and what were your words exactly? He said, Alan Doyle's coming to our wedding. Yeah. And he just walked up the street with his guitar swinging and big smile on his face. It was, yeah, he said, this great. looks like we're having a wedding. And yeah. he said, what do you want to sing, or what do you want to hear? And we said, whatever you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, something from St. John. So yeah. the first, he stayed, he sang two songs for us. It was... Yeah. beyond memorable, right? Just just blew us away. It's just, I love when I see a chance to be a tiny part of, you know, people's important days in their life, you know? And I think if you're playing a band for a living, you're always hoping that you can be, you know, a part of the soundtrack of people's lives in one way or another, you know? Or just be a tiny part of their day. And, you know, it's there's a lot of glum stuff going on in the world these days. So it's nice to, to bring a little extra smile if you can, whenever the opportunity happens uh, upon you. Unforgettable. Yeah. Uh, beyond expectation. You know, um, people are good. You know, it was all ideally to be a, uh, <laughs> to be a preamble to the Iceberg Alley show they get to see. And who knew that uh, they would be the only ones to get me, <laughs> get to see me play last weekend, so. And then of course the tent came down, uh, but of course we're all delighted that the city council stepped up and St. John's Sports Entertainment stepped up so much and uh, and allowed uh, the whole Iceberg Alley Tent Festival to just, you know, lock, stock and barrel, roll into the center. And there they are starting tonight. Uh, big wreck tonight, so. And when are you going to be performing? We moved our show to um, Sunday night. I'll be there on Sunday night. It's amazing. Great show of support and, uh, and uh, cooperation, I think. But I have to say, um, it's been our whole experience. Everything. Everybody, everything has been phenomenal. And there is a reason why Newfoundland has its reputation. <laughs> yeah, there's just a specialness. And yeah. we are delighted that this is ultimately where we chose yeah. to, uh, to get married. Yeah, thank you, Newfoundland. Thank you, thank you Newfoundland, and all our new friends. Yeah. And thank you, Carolyn. I hope you come back. Oh, we'll be back. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, thank you.
Welcome back. A local documentary released on CBC Gem explores the grief of the Sexton family after Sarah Sexton's death and their efforts to transition her eldest daughter, Edwina, who has a mental disability, into a senior's residence. Me, Mom and COVID a year later was released several months ago on CBC, but this latest version has an added chapter visiting Edwina a year after Sarah's death to see her thriving. I got mom's cards, Vina, with our little saying on it for you. Oh, I see you, There. Now mom is with you, too. You can make me cry now. We're in the dining hall area of Edwina's home in, at Northmont. So you hear all the noise in the background. The kitchen staff are, are fussing and getting ready for supper. We uh, set out to make a sort of um, uh, a, a love letter, if you will, to my mom, to our mom. And uh, what, what ended up happening was that I became the shepherd, Edwina became the star, and uh, we went from there. This was a project I put it into CBC. Uh, when they were looking for COVID projects. And, you know, we just brought up a little paragraph and uh, Nick and I got together with Nigel, of course, and uh, we set out to make this documentary. The doctors told mom that Edwina suffered from brain damage at birth due to a lack of oxygen. They were trying to get mom to put her into a home so that she could learn at her capability, but mom was having no part of that. She wanted Edwina around her family and our family was going to take care of Edwina. Simple as that. Edwina's really coming to her own to this place. You know, she lived on Ennis Avenue with mom for 72 years, and now she's moved into, this is her home and her friends and family, and she very much loves it here, and they're really good to her. So it's a, it's a, a win-win situation. We wanted people to be, you know, to look at it and be kind. Uh, we found that, you know, when we were making the film, we had a lot of people that were very good to us and shared their stories with us. Um, and, and I hope that people take from it uh, that, you know, if, if, uh, if you watch this documentary, I hope that it, it, it inspires you to be a better person, to be, you know, be kind to one another. And, uh, we, you know, we're all in this together and we, we have to uh, hold the rope. We, we're, looks like we're getting a fourth wave of this. And I, I just hope that people are respectful and will, you know, uh, be safe. And if you'd like to see the documentary, it's available to watch anytime on the CBC Gem app. You can download that app for free. Now, as Meg Roberts reported earlier, demonstrations were held across all 10 provinces today. This to protest against measures put in place to fight COVID-19. Now, ahead of the anti-vaccine protests, organizers had described them as silent vigils, with most gathering outside of hospitals. Politicians and healthcare organizations were quick to criticize today's demonstrations, calling them completely unacceptable and unfair to healthcare workers and patients. Past protests focused on both public health measures like wearing a mask and the prospect of proof of vaccination systems. They were against pandemic safety measures such as vaccine passports. Protesters say vaccination should be a choice and not mandatory. COVID-19 outbreaks at schools across the country have resulted in some canceled classes and even some closures. All of that marring the first week back for students. And one expert is advising people not to lose sight of the bigger picture. The minute you have in-person learning, there will be cases and there will be outbreaks. The goal is really to keep the outbreaks small. Can you diagnose the cases early? Can you isolate the children who test positive to avoid infecting others? Now, some schools in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island are among those shut down due to COVID-19 outbreaks. And in Quebec, where 20% of schools are reporting cases, the province is rolling out rapid testing in 72 schools to help detect those infections.
Time for a check of your full weather forecast. Again, Ryan in for Ashley this evening. And boy, I mean, we're talking about a temperature cool down over the next couple of days. A beautiful day today across most of the island, but well, temperatures are really going to be cut down here across the northwest half of the island and in through Labrador over the next 24 hours. Special weather statements are in effect for Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Eagle River and up the coast of Labrador. And you can see where that low departing into the North Atlantic and we'll see that cool northwest flow wrapping in on the other side of this system. And that is what's prompting uh, that to Pretty good chance for some snow, mainly over the higher terrain, but can't rule it out for places like Happy Valley Goose Bay for tonight. Area of high pressure moving into the region in behind will bring uh, some calm conditions in behind that. But uh, yes, some cooler air as well. 11 in Labrador City to Moosonee today, 10 in Churchill. And yeah, any of that warm stuff is being squeezed out. And here we want to walk you through your next uh, couple of days. There's that wet snow mixing in tonight, especially over those higher terrain areas. Shower chances for the West Coast and as far east as Bonavista and Gander tomorrow and those northwest winds again really impacting those temperatures 16 to 19 for the southeast parts of the uh, province yet 6 to 8 from Nain to Labrador City and as we walk through Tuesday night into Wednesday that northerly flow will kind of move in across the eastern parts of Newfoundland as well pretty nice Wednesday overall sun and clouds some increasing clouds throughout the day can't rule out a very late day shower along the west coast but it's primarily Labrador, where we're going to be seeing some showers on Wednesday, though some sunshine possible in the morning for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Clouds and showers into the afternoon. Cartwright, the Straits also into some late day shower chances, as you can see here. Those showers pushing in across the island for Wednesday night and through Thursday. And in fact, this looks like a pretty damp start to the day and even some periods of rain possible. Clearing, though, from west to east later Thursday with some sunshine starting to breakthrough in places like Cornerbrook and the Northern Peninsula. So your five day forecast for St. John's couple of nice days, although note the big temperature drop happening for the east on Wednesday, 12, 13 degrees. Northerly winds. Yeah, welcome to September for sure. But we do recover as we work our way through Thursday into Friday uh, temperature wise anyway. And at this point, Saturday looking OK. Shower chances looking more likely to creep in for Sunday, but we'll keep you posted on that. Showers Tuesday and then again Thursday for central parts of Newfoundland. Again, the west coast looking rather damp and cool tomorrow. Showers back on tap for Thursday, and it looks like a late day chance of showers pushing in uh, for Saturday at this point. Into Labrador, and again, we will wake up to some flurries, especially mixing in over the higher terrain areas tomorrow. That special weather statement in place and then temperatures Possibly back up as mild as 20 degrees by the time we get to Friday and for Lab West again chance of flurries, but then clearing for tomorrow some rain for Wednesday and then some shower chances hanging on as we work our way into the weekend. That is your forecast to now. Anthony, Carolyn, back to you. Thanks so much, Ryan. Good to see him. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, for one St. John's couple, Hurricane Larry made for a memorable night. Yeah, they were loudly awakened by a 125 year old maple tree crashing down in their backyard, just barely missing their house. Heard a huge bang. I think Heather, our neighbor, said it was around 3 or 5. And then we looked out and we saw that a huge branch of this tree was missing. And we didn't see it at first. It had fallen to the side of our house. Luckily, like right between all the houses. So it was, was lucky. Until the morning when uh, a neighbor rang on our door and said, hey, uh, that tree fell on your gas tank. So that's when the whole thing got a little bit more complicated. Well, I was worried about the tree. That was my biggest worry. We've had a big branch come down before, but I never could have imagined that a piece this big would come down. Yeah. So yeah. in terms yeah. of the tree, it's worse than we were expecting. In terms of our house, the surrounding houses, everyone's safety, we're just grateful. We came out here and there was already half the neighborhood on their feet, cutting down the tree and moving the branches out to Willy Cuts, to the back of Willicott's Lane. Like, it was really a group effort. I think every single household in the neighborhood here had someone here helping us. Yeah. This summer we said, hey, let's finally get this fence fixed up. The paint was all peeling and some of the palings were rotten. So we got it done. The guy finished up on Monday. The last paint stroke was done on Monday. And then, yeah, then the hurricane came and now we got to call him back. Uh, we got to start over. <laughs> you know, I think with climate change and the, the increasing activity happening, the increasing weather events, things like this are going to keep happening. And, and that's for sure a big concern for us. 
We yeah. hope that the tree will, will survive. We have an arborist coming this afternoon just to make sure it's safe. We're not going to leave anything that's not safe. Yeah. But I think we have just much bigger concerns in terms of uh, climate change and, and the future with these kinds of events happening. Well, well it's good to see uh, neighbours actually pitching together. And earlier on the show, we heard from arborist uh, Ryan Painter, Carolyn, and mm -hmm. he actually mentioned to me that one of the issues that uh, he's a little bit concerned about is people sort of looking at the damage and then thinking, you know what, we can take down that whole tree. Whereas as in that item that you just saw, you can actually have a tree sustain a fair bit of damage. But in the end, you might just need to do a little bit of nipping and tucking and you can save that tree. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good to call in the professionals too. You had a bit of damage to your property. Yes, thank you for mentioning it. <laughs> I have to say, what I was watching, I was watching those poor people who just managed to get their fence done and the tree comes down. I mean, at least yeah. nobody was hurt, but uh, I think a lot of people uh, lost a bit of fencing, shall we say. I was talking to some of our colleagues around the office, common story, not just here, but I think right across eastern Newfoundland, a lot of fences down, trees. So it'll take a while, but uh, eventually we'll get everything cleaned up, you know, mm -hmm. and as we reported, you can put the small bits in your recycling bags and the city will take as many as you can pack away. And... The bigger stuff, well, that's just going to take a little bit more work. Yeah, and you can yeah. bring it down to Kitty Vitty Lake parking lot, I think was one of the places. Mm -hmm. And Bowering Park is another place that you can bring those bigger branches that you need to get rid of. I fared pretty well in it. I didn't have a lot of damage, just a few branches yeah. uh, that fell. Fortunately, my beehive though, Anthony, made it through just fine. Good, I was gonna ask you, I was afraid what the answer might be. No, and you know, it's the, good. The, the cheapskate in me is really happy because there's going to be a lot of firewood. Free Good fire. Good point. Wood. Good yeah. point. Just has to dry out a little bit. Yep, just as the temperatures are starting to drop. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. We'll try and do this again tomorrow, right, Carolyn? That's right. We'll be here. Right. Hope to see you then. Good night. Good night.